Okay, I'm going to start talking so we can count as an on-time uh, departure. It's like the airlines, you pull away from the gate and you're on time. Mm -hmm. Even though we're still waiting for a couple of name tags, so I apologize for that. Here's my joke for the day. I've requested cocktails to be delivered to the room and no one is coming with them. <laughs> so, just so you know, I did ask. No, I didn't, but nevertheless. Um, can we have the PowerPoints? Good. I almost never use PowerPoint because I call it powerless pointless. Uh, and that's because in my hands, that's what it is. My name is Sue Swenson. I'm the president of Inclusion International. Besides the key points about what inclusion has done around voting, I need you to know two things about me. I funded a self-advocacy voting project in the United States in 2000. It's called GoVoter.org, and you can look at what people with intellectual disabilities are doing throughout the United States about voting. It's now become funded by a federal law called the Help America Vote Act. So um, it's ongoing. And the second thing is, before I left the Obama administration, I was able to fund $20 million into artificial intelligence to uh, automatic personalization for people with disabilities with the theory that if we do this right, people would be able to approach any web-enabled device and have it automatically respond to their accessibility needs, whatever those needs are. That project is ongoing um, and it has partnerships across business and across um, nonprofits in the US. I'm telling you that only because I do believe one thing that's missing here is government at the Zero Project. And last year I noted that many projects were funded by government because I had funded them at various points. Um, and I just want you as advocates to always keep in mind to advocate for research budgets because Research and demonstration is where all of these innovations come from unless they're funded by private foundations. And sometimes we forget to mention that a government grant is behind it. And it's very hard now in these times to keep money in research budgets. So I just wanted to remind you that that's important. Here's what uh, Inclusion International has done. In partnership with the UN Democracy Fund, we focused on three count countries, uh, Kenya, Zanzibar, and Lebanon, to identify and challenge the barriers people with intellectual disabilities face in exercising their right to civic engagement and political participation. Our work is not about ballot tools. I'm just gonna go through this very quickly. We are very clear that political participation is not simply the act of casting a ballot on election day. You certainly have heard from Sweden and many other persons, uh, many other people about all of the work that goes behind making it possible for people with uh, intellectual disabilities and other disabilities to vote. Uh, we have Spain in the room. They've done tremendous work on their legal structures to make it possible to vote. Um, we believe that inclusive po political partation, participation is better for all people, that getting to the ballot box is as much about building inclusive communities as it is about improving electoral laws, policies, and practices. We think that inclusive political participation ensures the equal rights of people with intellectual disabilities. It promotes equity. It eradicates stereotypes. When a person with a disability is at the polling place, other people begin to understand that these people are all full citizens and they all belong. And it's a little way we change beliefs every day when people are participating. And we believe that public uh, per perception is transformed. We use these, uh, we develop these resources. They can be used in all countries by governments, families, and people with intellectual disabilities. One is called Accessing the Ballot Box, Inclusive Civic Engagement for People with Intellectual Disabilities. Another is called My Voice Matters. It's training programs and guides for people with intellectual disabilities. And the third is Inclusive Civic Engagement. All of these can be found on our website if you look there. If you don't find them there, 
My email is sue.swenson at inclusion-international.org. I would be happy to hear from you at any point. Um, these are some of the barriers that people face. I'm going to skip those because I want to give as much time to this brilliant panel as I possibly can. The folks sitting here with me have worked very hard on creating tools to help people with disabilities access the ballot box. And um, I can pronounce some names. Uh, I'm going to start with Tamar. Tamar, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself so that I do not butcher your name. <laughs> Secondly, I'm going to go to Sam. Oddly enough, I know how to pronounce, pronounce his name. And third will be Engin and his team, who he will all introduce to you. So please, Tamar, the time is yours. Uh, from there. Tamar Shvania, this is my surname, <laughs> chairperson of the Central Election Commission of Georgia. Dear colleagues and participants, I would like to take this opportunity and thank entire Zero Project team, experts, participants for our recognition, but also for the incredible opportunity to share not only our policy, but also to learn innovative and effective solutions to problems that persons with disabilities face on a daily basis. Let me share with you our Georgian experience, uh, including recent innovations and success stories in terms of accessibility and voter-friendly environment. Creating an accessible and uh, equal electoral environment has been an integral part of our administration and the number of activities we carried out at different times as well as the policies are a good illustration of it, including creating tactile ballot guide for blind voters, which I will cover below in detail. And due to years of hard work and engagement of key stakeholders in the project today, I stand here with key experts in the field of disability and have the honor to share our Georgian experience. So, let me walk you through our journey from using ballot paper in braille font and ending up with rather sophisticated and user-friendly tactile ballot guide. So, who we are and what do we do? We are the primary body in Georgia re responsible for preparation and conduct of referendum, plebiscite and elections for President of Georgia, the Parliament of Georgia, local self-government representative and executive bodies, Sakra Bule and Mayor. And we control the fulfillment of requirements of the electoral legislation on the whole territory of Georgia and its uniform application. We set agenda and shape policies through annual adapted action plan and strategic plan. As far as implementation of politic, pol policies is concerned, creating an equal environment for all, including persons with disabilities, is among the main priorities for our administration. Despite several projects implement, implemented by the Central Election Commission in recent years, blind voters living in Georgia were unable to vote independently without the assistance of another person. To address the issue, we looked at international best practices and collaborated with a number of NGOs, including the Union of the Blind in Georgia. A special working group is established at the CEC, which is composed of CSOs, different agencies, and the platform is effectively used to discuss PVD issues. Hence, the next step was to look what we had on hand and whether it worked well. In other words, pros and cons of ballot paper in Braille. Previous experience indicated that the ballot paper printed in Braille font caused a violation of the principal principle of secrecy and prevented voters from independent participation. Another important aspect to consider is that a certain number of the blind voters living in Georgia cannot read the Braille. The CEC, in order to ensure independent participation of blind voters and following in intensive meetings held with the Union of Blind, developed tactile ballot guide. 
as it, come, as it came to our attention, Braille was not the most effective way for blind voters to vote. And we started thinking, but most importantly, we started acting. And as a result, we came up with tactile ballot guide. Ballot guide is made of durable paper and was renewed in 2017, namely the upper left side of the form was cut, enabling the blind voter to accurately place ballot paper in the guide. Textile ballot guide is produced of special paper. The form is bilingual. Once the ballot paper is under renewed guide, the voter is assured that his her marked choice on textile ballot corresponds to the number of the candidates on the ballot paper. Oval cutouts are intended for use during referendum and plebiscite. I, I have this uh, ballot guides here with me. Along the cutout holes, the form has clearly shaped dots enabling the blind voters to count desired cutout hole. Under oval cutouts are clearly shaped signs of plus and minus. What is special about tactile ballot guide and why we value and maintain it? The uniqueness of the tactile ballot guide lies in the fact that it can be used in all types of elections, presidential, parliamentary, municipal, as well as during uh, the direct force forms of democracy, such as referenda and plebiscite. The guide can be used multiple times and does not require knowledge of the Braille font. A tactile ballot guide project can be implemented in other countries since its production does not require large financial expenses and can be used in all types of elections. Within the framework of international meetings, the CEC may disseminate uh, the information about the tactile ballot guide and offer to redistribute service on other countries, in other countries. Only having an innovative solution is not enough to make it work, but visibility and good promotion are key when it comes to the success of any project, and that's what we actually did. To promote the guide and explain how it works, uh, the CEC produced videos and partnered with the Union of the Blind to hold information sessions and mock elections. As a result, figures indicate that the number of blind voters' independent participation in elections has gradually increased over the years. No project policy can survive time and achieve and then maintain success if it's not sustainable and universal, or in other words, if it can't be successfully used in different occasions. In our case, in all types of elections, referendum and plebiscite. And indeed our, indeed, our policy is unique in this sense. Tactile Ballot Guide uh, is funded by State Budget of Georgia, and finances are envisaged in the budget and no threat to cutting funds or producing insufficient amount of the ballot guides is estimated. The Tactile Ballot Guide is made of durable paper and is less prone to damage the CEC used standardized ballot paper, so the guide can be used in all elections in Georgia. If a number of candidates exceed 30, the standard of the ballot paper is subject to change, and the tactile ballot guide needs to be developed over again. Positively, the number of the candidates have never exceeded 30. Thus, no risk was detected in terms of using the tactile ballot guide. In case of introducing e-voting technologies into electoral system, tactile ballot guide will experience radical change. What exactly made our policy successful? A fair guess would be engagement, engagement, and again engagement. Indeed, we did involve all key stakeholders in this process. Speaking of success, factors, engagement of different actors, namely engagement of CSOs in developing tactile ballot guide is worth underlying. As such, CSOs, we are in favor of the idea of tactile ballot guide eventually leading to greater success. And most importantly, the decision of the CEC to run this project was not unilateral, but made in close cooperation with civil society organizations. And now the question is how to spread the word and engage as many blind voters as possible in elections, if not by well-developed and well-planned series of events and gathering with CSOs working on this issue. 
to expand cooperation with organizations working on issues of blind voters throughout holding a number of the meetings is our plan. Working meetings will aim at the promotion of tactile ballot guide among blind voters and encouraging them for, to participate in electoral processes and become active citizens. With this, it's not working. <laughs> Okay, with this, uh, I would like to wish you all the success in all your endeavors, significant progress in overcoming obstacles impending the creation of a just and fair society where persons with disabilities independently participate in public and political life and nobody is left behind. And I truly believe with this spirit and readiness and experience and expertise, we may come closer to achieving an inclusive environment for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tamar. And we hope to have time for questions at the end, so please make a note if you have a question. Sam, it's your, it's your turn. Okay. Hello, I'm Sam Campbell. I'm the General Manager for the Asia Pacific region for CITAL. I'm honoured to be here today in Vienna at this wonderful and inclusive event. CITL is proud to have been selected by the Zero Project to talk about its role in the iVote Project in New South Wales in 2015, and thanks to you all for taking the time to hear a little bit about the iVote Project. Um, firstly, some background. CITL is a bus, bus liner based software company, and we specialise in software around elections. We extend into services and other sorts of areas, but at the core, we're a software manu manufacturer, and the core product is around online voting. We operate worldwide, and there's been projects delivered in Australia since 2005. Um, we first engaged with New South Wales uh, in 2014, and, and that continues. Um, we did a project with the New South Wales Electoral Commission, which I'm going to go into, but the New South Wales Electoral Commission is, is the body responsible for delivering elections across the state of New South Wales in Australia. Australia has seven states. Um, it's the largest state. It's got a population of about five million, just over five million voters. They went to an open tender to procure the elements of the iVote system and largely the electronic ballot box for which CITAL tendered and was successful. But ultimately, there was a reason that New South Wales government went for the, I, for the I vote system. In Australia, we have a compulsory voting um, environment. I heard earlier that Brazil has one too, and Tamara just mentioned one herself in Georgia. Um, because you get fined in Australia um, when you fail to vote, you'll get a ticket in the mail, you'll need to, need to pay it. And there was a gentleman uh, in 2008 who disputed that in court, and he said that because he was blind, uh, he was unable to vote because the election was unsuccessful. Um, in, in a rare case, he, was, he won and the government was um, asked to produce accessible solutions for elections to effectively help the blind to vote. There were earlier projects around Braille and those sorts of tools to help um, the visually impaired vote. But in New South Wales, uh, observation was that 10% of visually impaired people in New South Wales can actually read Braille. He was in the 90% and hence when he went to court he was successful. The government agreed to the use of internet and phone voting and in an early project there, were, there was a small number of voters uh, from the blind community who participated and what, what resulted from that was a fairly expensive project for a, a small number of people. So the blind low vision peak bodies went to the government and said that they wanted to help this project be successful and they asked for other people to use the system. By having other people use the system, that helps with the economics behind the supply of a solution. But ultimately, what we have in New South Wales is a legislated requirement, so it's not a trial, whereas many online voting projects around the world are trials. This is actually a government requirement now to deliver. So for the innovation, in Australia we have, um, the different states have different different solutions, but largely a paper ballot system. And to give you an idea, this was the New South Wales one. Oh. Now, <laughs> I can't read it without my glasses, and I need newer glasses to read it. It's in a smaller font. Actually, one of the states recently in their election, they had to provide magnifying glasses because the font was getting small. 
creates barriers to people, and hence, hence that went, went into this direction of online voting, which can create a screen that can be used by people online, or an IVR system where people can um, make their way through, through the voting, the ballot paper. Uh, previous projects in Australia have successfully addressed the needs of um, visually impaired voters, but they've been attendance solutions, where someone needs to attend a polling place, and that was found that that did meet the needs of some voters, but there were other voters whose needs were still not met, and so hence this view to try the, um, the online approach. Looking at the impact. Um, for those who follow online voting, and I'm not getting into a full discussion about online voting, but there is an ongoing discussion about whether it actually increases participation. Now, in Australia, because we have a compulsory voting environment where people get fined if they don't vote, we have had people come up and say, I haven't voted before in privacy. I've now voted privately, um, or I have voted for the first time because I didn't trust the earlier solutions. So we actually have experienced people who have um, voted for the first time, and so there is a view that participation is enhanced. What we've seen in the growth of the service, though, in the first time it was delivered um, 40, about 50,000 votes, but then in 2015, which is the main project we're talking about, that went up to 286,000 votes, which is about 5% of the voting population. The next election is in about a month, and we're looking at about 10%, which is about 500,000 votes. The system's actually being extended to cater for multiple languages to increase accessibility because we have a, a large number of people in Australia who don't speak English, and so we're catering to, to that need as well. The project has been extended into the Western Australia, another state of, of Australia, and they have a, a, effectively a different need. They're very, um, it's a very large state, and it takes up 30% or so of the Australian mainland, a lot of desert, and staffing polling booths there is challenging. And so getting to some of the um, visually impaired in some of those communities is also a challenge. They have a much smaller voting population and in that case they really did target only a few voters because for them it was a trial. New South Wales was the world's largest online voting project to date um, for a binding government election. Now the people who can use the system are persons with disabilities, those unable to vote without assistance, a silent elector, which is a person in Australia who, for whatever reason, has a protected address. Um, they live more than 20 kilometres from a ballot box or those who are travelling and overseas. Success factors. Basically, voters loved it. There was a, there's a, a review of voters at the end of the election. 97% um, satisfaction, positive satisfaction rate from voters. and. A person from the Electoral Commission, I saw him present one day, and he, said, he made a comment to the effect that if he gave $10 to all voters, he wouldn't get 97%. So he was very impressed. Um, other, other success factors, the blind to low vision community requested the government to include remote voters, basically to make the cost of running the service work. Um, it's an expensive project to run the first time, but as, um, as the scale of a project increases, so does cost but by bringing in all these other voters, you can then distribute that cost over, over more people. New South Wales and CITEL are very, serious about very serious about election security. We've had our system pulled apart, audited, um, looked into by multiple bodies, both government and external. But effectively, a government critical success factor, which they remind us of as a provider constantly, is to maintain elector trust in the election platform. Um, a little bit there about funding. Effectively, the project has grown over time, but if you've seen it, the numbers earlier, we've grown by orders of magnitude between projects. The delivery of um, the Braille system in the past wasn't as expensive as this project. However, it addressed a much smaller number of people, so effectively, it, it, was, it wasn't cost effective. Looking to next steps, CITEL, as a provider, has used this, um, this technology, or very similar, in other countries like Switzerland, Canada, Norway. Um, we work on keeping it accessible, we, we work on multilingual environments as well, um, and we can see that this extending out to pick up votes from people who are confined to their beds or in hospitals and those sorts of locations as well. 
Other states in Australia are evaluating the system and there are similar sorts of projects in other parts of the world. But ultimately, these projects are driven forward by the affected groups interacting with parliaments and legislations and putting a case to prevent, sorry, to meet the needs of voters equally. Um, what we've seen is people will approach electoral commissions and say we need these sorts of solutions, but electoral commissions, at least in my environment, can't do that. They implement legislation. If you want these sorts of solutions to meet the needs of the impaired, then you do need to, um, you, you need to talk to legislative bodies. Thank you for your time. Um, thanks also to New South Wales Electoral Commission for having the conference in sight as a partner for the delivery of the project, and feel free to seek me out and ask me any questions at any stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Engen, I'm going to hand it over to you. OK. Welcome, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, actually, as a blind person, I am wondering about how many people are there here. Can you club yourself again? <laughs> Stronger, I think. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, our, the name of our presentation is Accessible and Confidential Election Possible, No Need to Postpone. Why? This is the name of the, our campaign in uh, 2018 election in Turkey because still we are st trying to persuade Turkish government, Turkish Electoral Supreme Court about the possibility of confidential election for blind people. So we have a team, me as an Engin, uh, I am the president of APFA, and uh, also uh, Hande Sart from Boazic University, and Sevda Yilmaz also from APFA. Uh, let's talk about together, and uh, Hande, uh, can you introduce our organizations? Sure. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I try to get our next... Yeah. All right. I did it. So my name is Hande Sard. I'm a faculty member at Boazici University and plus disability coordinator of the university. I just want to give you a brief introduction about Boazici University. We have a laboratory, laboratory for education and technology for people with visual disabilities. It's not serving for only our students, but also uh, around the whole country. And I will let you know that my university is a public university is doing the advocacy work, which we call it evidence-based research re regarding advocacy. So one of the leading uh, universities in Turkey. And now I will give the floor to Sevda, so she will mention about the association. Here we go. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Yes, this is Sevda from Barrier Access. Uh, Barrier Access Association um, has found in 2005 as a 2005 as a a small group, eight or ten people are together and try to make the imagine real. So our aim to increase the equality, independency, and uh, being free, all the people with visually impaired in Turkey and maybe all over the world. We are a small group, but we are the idea, uh, we are creating idea, we are creating people to demand their rights and although they are blind, although they, are, they have different, um, different uh, disab disabilities, they are demanding their rights. So. Okay, uh, now let's, what is our aim for, the, what is the reason about this project? Unfortunately, there is no any electronic election system in Turkey and uh, it seems that it will not be in, ten, in the future 10 or 20 years old because of uh, the other political issues. So we have to use the ballot system. So. Uh, from this, actually, our project is very similar to Georgia, uh, the uh, project of Tamara. We developed a better template because to use confidential election. Here, for us, accessible accessibility means 
choosing freely, free of cho cho uh, choosing freely without the help of others to do something. Okay, this is very important. And for this, uh, for this, we produced templates like uh, guides. And in those templates, uh, of course, there is no braille ballot because if there is braille ballot, then the confidentiality uh, become violated. So in the template, we put the ballot into uh, into template, and there are uh, candidates, and there are round hole round holes uh, under the candidates, and people can choose uh, which uh, uh, candidate to uh, elect. But here we also do something different. We also narrated all the candidates in each election region in Turkey. So uh, people, even if they don't know Braille, they can count the order, then they can vote. So uh, our innovative part here is uh, simplicity. It is very simple. Everyone can count uh, the runs. And cheapness. Very important. The system is very ballot paper template, so it is very cheap, and people can use all the things in the uh, position. So, uh, Seda, can you tell us the impact about that issue? Of course. Okay, um, 2000, uh, 2018 and 2017, we had um, two different elections in Turkey. The 2017, we have referendum election. It's it was very simple because only you have the chance no or yes. It's easy for us. But in 2018 election, we have prudential and the parliamentary election, and we have prepared accessible ballot for the uh, people with disabilities approximately for the first election um, three. 3,000 ballots, accessible ballot, and the second election for parliamentary and presidential election, we prepared an, um, in total um, uh, 6,000 6, yeah, 6, uh, ballots. And we have prepared the ballot, accessible ballot, and you see on the picture, I think, now, you, we are preparing the, the process of the preparing ballot. We are arranging the people with disabilities and volunteer people. And that's the process. Okay. Uh, fine. Let's, let's go to the financing issue, Hande Hocam. All right. So the thing is that, well, you may ask whether is it the responsibility of the university to, in a way, guarantee the right to vote confidentiality. Well, it shouldn't be the case, so we ask our government to support us. However, it didn't happen that way. So what we did it for 2018 election, so there's a photo and me and Engin, uh, and in the middle is our rector. So Boğaziçi University supported the, uh, the cost of those election ballots. So, and supporting in a way that that will be a, a kind of a, a good example for the uh, coming elections. That was our hope. And lastly, as a next step, our final aim is to accessible make accessible election possible to accept legal authorities to make a law about accessibility can be assured. Uh, unfortunately, now the law says that the, the blind person can vote with the help of another person. So we would like to guarantee that everyone could vote uh, uh, confidentially. And we have a brief video. Accessible election possible, no need to postpone. A sighted man enters to the room with a blind elector man in his arm. My friend is going to cast his ballot. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Stamp and ballot are given to the sighted man. They are passing to voting both. It's separated with a curtain. The blind elector and sighted man are together. Oh, you casted my ballot? Yes, I did. You were going to vote for right? Shit. The elector looks frustrated. A blind woman elector with a white cane comes to voting alone. She has accessible templates in her hand. 
Hello. Hi, welcome. Thank you. I've come to cast my ballot. I want to use this accessible ballot template. Okay, I will prepare it for you. All right. The polling clerk takes it. He puts the ballot into template. Here is your template. Thank you. I'm giving your envelope. Here, this is your envelope. Thank you. This is your stamp here. Okay, one second. I got them. Thank you. I wish you luck. The woman elector passes behind the curtain alone, put things in her hands on the table. The form of template is rectangular. The short dates are on the right and left sides. She's reading the braille writings on it. Those are also in print. On top, presidential election, and under it, the names of candidates are written next to each other. Under each candidate, there are round holes for stamp. Names from left to right are Muharrem Ince, Meral Akşener, Recep Tayyip Erdoğan, Selahattin Demirtaş, Temel Karamollaoğlu, and Bu Perinçek. Okay, we can stop here, I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, we have an accessibility pledge. We uh, said it everything. And I would like to say it for, uh, for you. Till one day, at the same time with everybody, beginning with accessibility, watching all the movies with description, reading all the books with no exception, having education with no discrimination, appending the signature in equal condition, voting alone in confidential position, attending equally to production, using all the software, hardware, and uh, website with full satisfaction, walking freely on streets, buildings, and squares without, without, with no inhibition, making the whole life equal, accessible, and barrier-free, will keep on fighting. Thank you for listening to us. And now, the magic moment when you can ask questions. And if you don't have a question immediately, I am going to ask a question, assuming that the organizers put me here in the middle for a reason. <laughs> My son had intellectual disability. He was also legally blind. We know the demographics of blindness are that it occurs much more frequently in the elderly than it does in young people, as does cognitive disability. So what about your solutions can be applied to people who have co-occurring blindness or low vision and cognitive impairment? Maybe that's a tough question. Maybe that requires a second level of innovation, but I believe it's an important question. An intellectual Cognitive disability and blindness. Okay, for us, yeah, uh, in template system, uh, in template system, only the requirement is knowing the round holes, okay? counting the rentals. If they can count it, then they can use uh, the vote before. But of course, there may be other solutions, but I think that simplicity can, may give an opportunity. Please. So, <clears throat> this is a very interesting question, and I would like to provide some answer what we use actually, what is our experience in Georgia. So uh, we, as Central Election Commission of Georgia, we ensured full adoption of our website for blind people and for the people some visual impairments because there are two different you know, options for blind people to read this website information. And this is fully adapted and based on international standards. And all blind people, they get all kind of information related to the elections. And also the people with some visual impairment to having some at least 10% of the site, they can you know, use different colors, different size fonts, you know, appropriate frame for them to get the information. That's one, number one. When it comes to the polling station, of course, we have the problem of uh, adapted polling stations because some people, they think that only 
adoption is only important for wheelchair users like to have and make sure to have the ramps. But in fact, adoption is also necessary for blind people. They need to get access to the, uh, you know, polling station. And these kind of problems we have in our country. But when it comes to the voter inside the polling station, we provide two different tools. The first one is, as I mentioned, tactile ballot guide for fully blind people. And the second one, my colleague also from Australia mentioned, this is magnifying sheet, which is like increasing the uh, text for uh, the persons with some visual impairments. And also some elder people, like for getting their glasses, they very successfully use this magnifying sheet just to read the uh, content of the ballot paper and make their choice independently. Thank you. Sam, anything? A lot of the accessibility in elections I've seen has to do with um, making a voting system approachable. Uh, for some, for, for councils, say, in Australia, you might just select a one if there's five people. So you can simplify your environment a bit so that um, when, when a voter looks into their information, they're, they're quite good at working out what they want and what they want and what they would like to do. And if the answer is as simple as putting in a one, then they're usually quite, that they can find their way through that system. The ballot paper I showed us a demo before. If you vote below the line on that, you need to put 15 numbers in, and there have been people who say that that in itself is a barrier, and that um, maybe that is used by political parties to uh, make the, the environment interesting. Yeah. When I look in other countries, I've, I've heard of similar things, different coloured boxes, different symbols, so that people can take an association they have from before the voting day, and, yeah. and they have in their mind what they want to do, and they can use that through the system. Thank you. Thanks to all three for being willing to answer that question that I had. Does anybody else have a question? Yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Virginia Atkinson from IFIS, and I had a question for um, Tamar from Georgia. Just wondering if you could share from a government perspective any guidance for the DPOs in the room on how they can engage with their election management body at home. So I know you are very active in coordinating with, with DPOs, with CIL, and with others. But what is your guidance for, for DPOs in the room that have a harder time engaging with their election management body? The question was related to the government approach, yeah? So, um, when it comes to the government approach in Georgia, I need to mention, of course, the election code, uh, because I know this code very well, and the, that was actually taken as a responsibility by, by the government of Georgia, and the parliament made respective corrections and respective amendments to the election code, just to ensure, for instance, and this is obligatory for all the premises where the polling stations are located, to ensure ramps and adapt all the polling stations for wheelchair users. That's an obligation according to the election code. Of, all, of course, there is one, um, uh, some kind of, um, uh, let's say, um, problem in this uh, article. It's if it's possible, that's it, it written in this way. But of course, our government is doing uh, lots of, you know, um, activities just to make sure that the premises uh, which might be adapted, because not all the premises might be adapted, and unfortunately we have infrastructure problem in Georgia, and not all the premises are appropriate to adapt for the uh, for um, uh, persons with disabilities. And this kind of, you know, obligations government they have, they, uh, of course, uh, there is also reports submitted by public defender about the uh, rights and um, of uh, persons with disabilities uh, we, when we are talking about about the different um, uh, kind of disabilities. But one biggest problem what we have, this is the database of these persons. Because of the new law of personal information, it's not uh, always um, possible for election manager body to get the information whether these people, where, where they live, just to make sure that we provide respective uh, service uh, to the voters, to different kind of the voters, uh, I mean, different uh, having the different uh, disabilities. So, uh, government, they do their best, but still we have the problems. Uh, and uh, we established, as a Central Election Commission, uh, some kind of working group uh, consisting of different government agencies, inviting Ministry of Education, uh, because many polling stations are located in uh, schools, uh, also inviting local uh, self-government bodies uh, and the Ministry of Regional Infrastructure, because lots of uh, polling stations are, so, are also um, located in kindergartens, in different premises, 
agencies owned by local self-government. We also invited different kind of agencies and we established working group just to make sure that all the problems are solved for um, persons with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment on how DPOs can approach governments about accessible systems? Otherwise, I'm going to ask if there are other questions. Uh, actually, in Turkey, as I said before, uh, the government uh, only permits us to use tactile ballot templates, but uh, there is no legal requirement, so the Turkish Electoral Supreme Court refused to uh, embolse or uh, make the cost. Uh, the, the, so we, as a non-governmental organization, have to embolse such kind of templates. Great. Anybody else? I think it's now officially the arsenic hour. <laughs> it is now time when all we're going to do is relax a little bit before dinner and before the award ceremony. And I congratulate any awardees who are in the room and I look forward to what we're going to do together over the rest of the evening. And I can't believe there are still several hours of uh, of time together today. But thank you for being here. Thank you for being interested in this topic. I'm sure it's possible to reach all of the speakers should you have any further questions. My gratitude to the panelists for the parts that you've played here today. And the pledge is incredibly useful to us in many ways. We, will, <laughs> we can carry that forward, that work. So thank you so much and um, good evening.